So we've looked at financing leases from both the leasee and the leasor standpoint. We've looked at operating leases from both standpoint. We've looked at residual value on a financing lease, sales type lease for the leasor. Now let's look at what happens if there is a purchase option or what I call a bargain purchase option. That's what we used to call them. Now the writing of the US of, of US GAAP is a little bit different than it was then, but it's still if a purchase option exists that is almost certain to be taken advantage of or be exercised, then it is a financing lease. So how do we treat that purchase option? So Federated Fabrications leased a tooling machine on January 1st of 2024 for a three year period ending December 31st, 2026. The lease agreement specified annual payments of 36,000 beginning with the first payment at the beginning of the lease. So this is the beginning of period annuity due and each December 31st through 2025. The company had the option to purchase the machine on December 30th, 2026 for 45,000 when its fair value was expected to be 60,000, a sufficient difference that exercise seems reasonably certain. Again, there's never a guarantee, but it's reasonably certain. The machine's estimated useful life was six years with no salvage value. Federated was aware that the lessor's implicit rate of return was 10%. Now I will say this, even if there's a residual value, whether it's guaranteed or unguaranteed, we ignore it. Here's why. Because the bargain purchase option overrides it. We're not going to hand this asset back if we are pretty sure we're going to take advantage of that. We're going to own it. So even if it said there was a salvage value here, it really wouldn't impact us from a lease recording standpoint. Now it could go into play when we went to do the amortization expense for this period, but from this standpoint, it would not impact the actual calculations of the lease. We default, we use only the bargain purchase option or excuse me, the, the purchase option. They don't call it BPOs anymore, but that's my terminology. Hang in there. All right, so what do we do here? Well, first and foremost, we're going to calculate our lease payment. Or not our lease payment, excuse me, our right of asset. Uh, asset. We already know the lease payment at 36, so we know we're going to make $36,000 payments, and we're going to make three of those because it's a three-year lease. So we're going to do three $36,000 payments. So we know that. What we need to find is what we're going to record this asset at because, remember, we record the asset at the... Um, the asset at the present value of the of the minimum lease payment. Sorry, <laughs> it took me a moment. My brain sort of went into a fog for a second. So we record them at the present value of the minimum lease payments. We're going to pull that in. So how do we do that? Well, you can do it all in one fell swoop in the right of use asset in Excel. But basically what you're going to find is two things. One, you're going to find the present value of the lease payments. That's the 36. But embedded in that, you also have to include the $45,000 one-time lump sum payment at the end because that would be an additional payment. So you could do two PVs. You could do the PV of an annuity due for 36, bring that back. And then you can do the present value of a dollar, just a lump sum 45,000 and bring that back as well. And that would solve the problem. Now in Excel, we can do that all at once. We can just do the PV. Now we can write it out, but I'm just going to, I'm going to hard code this formula so you can see what we would do there. So first we've got the rate. These are annual payments. The implicit rate, which we know is 10%. Remember, if we don't know the implicit rate, we have no clue what the lessor used to calculate the $36,000 payment. We would have to default to our incremental borrowing rate. But here we know that. Say so we know the 10%. So our rate would be 10%. This is an annual payment, so we can leave it at, at 10%. We don't have to divide it by two or anything. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Then we need to know the period. This is a three-year period. So we're going to lease this for three years, and then at the end, we will uh, pay for it. <coughs> excuse me. So it's a three-year period for this lease. We do N of three. Our payment we know to be 36000 That would be your annuity due calculation. That you'd want to include next thing when it says future value this is optional you do not have to have it in there but since we know we're going to make that one-time future value payment very much like residual value of forty-five thousand, we want to include that and that will do the present value of the dollar that lump sum amount so by doing the thirty-six thousand here that does your present value of annuity by putting the forty-five thousand in as your future value that would actually do the um, present value of the lump sum one-time purchase option of 45000 
Then the last thing is that we want beginning or end. In this case, remember the first payment is due on day one, so you want to make sure you do beginning. Now in your calculator, you want to put it in begin mode, and you would do the same thing. You would do 10 would be your IY, 3 would be your N, 36,000 would be your PMT, your payment, 45,000 would be your F fee, and then you would compute your present value. Again, make sure you've placed your calculator into annuity due. In other words, you've got the BGN. You are in the beginning mode so that it calculates it properly. All right, when you do that, you get 132. So that is the present value of the minimum lease payment. So that's what we would actually record this lease at. Okay, now once we have that, that amount, we can go in and record our amortization chart. So notice there's going to be three payments of 36. But when there's a BPO or a purchase option, we're going to make that last payment of 45000 Okay. Now beyond that, the amortization chart is going to be exactly the same. We're going to take our outstanding balance. Well, actually, stop. We're making the payment on day one. So remember the first payment, there would be no interest. It would all go to principal. That's going to reduce the balance we owe. Then the 36, the next one, we would have interest of 10%. So we're going to do 96 to 89 times 10%. That's going to give our payment there. We're going to take the difference again here. That would give us 26, uh, 371. Then we're going to reduce our overall value. So each time we're just going to reduce. So carry value minus the 26. Then when we bring down our interest, we should end up at zero as long as we've got all our numbers in there. Now, if you're doing this with a calculator, you may end up being a dollar or two off simply because you've rounded. Excel does not round. So if I carry this out, notice Excel would have it to the penny. You can round to the whole dollar as you see here. You would just be slightly off right here in rounding. Why is that? Well, remember, the lessor doesn't need or the leaseor does not need to recuperate the full fair value through the lease payments because we're pretty sure you're going to take advantage. If not, then they're going to get the asset back and it would have a residual value at that point. Okay, because there's still two more years of life left. So if there's a bargain purchase option or purchase option that we're going to take advantage of, when you do the present value of the minimum lease payments, you go in and you include that BPO as part of the PV. That becomes the last payment because you're reasonably certain you're going to take advantage of it and then you will come out to zero. So it replaces residual value as well. If there was residual value and a BPO, we ignore residual value in the calculation of our PV, okay? You take the BPO instead, or the, part, or the purchase option. I keep saying BPO, the purchase option. I even label it BPO. All right, now what's our entries? The entries then are the same as a normal lease, okay? We're gonna go in and do right of use asset. Just like we would on a normal lease, we're going to carry that at the PV, not the fair value. We don't actually know the fair value in this problem. I'm assuming it's 132, but we don't know that. Always carry the right of asset at the present value of the minimum lease payments. Sometimes that does include the VPO, the purchase option. Then on day one, we are receiving that first payment. So we're going to go in and do our lease payable and our cash. And that's going to be for that first 36000 all of it will go to principal because no interest can accrue because it's on the same day. It's like a down payment, so to speak, in that. All right. How does that impact here? Well, our assets go up. Our liabilities go up. Nothing else occurs. There's no cash. There's no income statement. When we make that first payment, our assets do go down, as does our lease here. goes down. There we go. Still, there's no interest expense yet, so there's no income statement impact, but we do have a cash outflow. And again, this is a financing lease, so this is going to be an opera, or excuse me, a financing activity because you're paying down the lease payable, which acts sort of like a note. Long-term, non-operating debt. All right. Now, December 31st rolls around. There's a few things we're going to do. One, here we do need to amortize the asset, so we're going to hit amortization expense, and then we're going to reduce the right of use asset, 
Now you do not have to record that first. That's just how this problem I built it in. We do the amortization and then the lease payment. You could do the lease payment and then the amortization. Um, doesn't matter. You just wouldn't have quite the number of rows there you need. Now how much are we going to amortize? Well, we need to amortize the 132 to 89. Here's another difference between a BPO and a, a lease without a BPO. When you amortize, you're going to actually do it like straight line depreciation. You're going to have the asset minus the salvage over the useful life in years, not the lease life, because you're going to own this asset when you're done. So in this case, we're going to take that and we're going to divide it across six years, even though the lease is only for three. So we lease it today. We use it all of 24, all of 25, and all of 26. In theory, we would hand that back. But since there's an option, we're going to own it. At the end of the period, we need to amortize it over life. Now, when we actually purchase the asset, we do transition from a right of use into actual equipment or whatever we're buying here. And then from that point, we will depreciate the asset. Okay, so we will amortize it up in the time we purchase it. Once we purchase the asset and it becomes ours, then we have to switch this over and treat it as a normal fixed asset. Okay. All right. Then our right of use asset would go down by the 22, just like before. So we would reduce our overall assets and we reduce our income or equity here. Our expenses go up and our income goes down. And then of course there is no cash because this is amortization. There would not be any cash involved. Then the next thing we do is our interest or our lease payment. So we're going to record our interest expense on our lease payment. So we're going to go in and we're going to hit our interest expense for the 96 this time. We're going to reduce our lease payable. Our lease payable would be hit for the 26,371. Make sure I'm on the right line there. Sorry, checking my dates. And then our cash payment would go in at 36, just like before. We will have a little bit of difference here. Our assets do go down by the 36. That's the amount of the payment. On the flip side, our lease payable. So our debt is going down by 26 and our equity is going down by the interest expense of nine. The interest expense here does impact our income statement. So our expenses go up and our income goes down. This is a cash flow outflow for 36 and this would be a financing activity. You're like, wait, you're buying equipment. We are, but we financed. So it's a long-term note. So we financed our company. So it'd be financing. All right, moving on. December of 2025. Now to save time here, we're going to do pretty much the exact same entry. So I'm just going to copy and paste because you'll see it. We will do our amortization expense. You're like, wait a minute, what happened? That's okay. We're getting there. Our amortization would be the same. It would be that same amount each period. It is straight line. But remember, we do it over the economic life of the asset when there's a purchase option that we're going to take advantage of. Then our interest expense will change a little bit in that it would be 69. So we would go in and record the interest, the lease payable at 2908, and then, of course, our cash payment. The impact would be the same across the board as before. The only difference is it's a slightly different split between equity and payable. Notice our interest expense went down because our lease payable was reduced. So therefore, this time you'd have a little bit more impact to the debt than to the equity. But overall, it's still the same flow. All right. And then December 31st, what happens? Well, we would do the same exact thing yet again. We would come in. We would do our amortization expense. Our amortization expense would equal the 22 again. Straight line across six years, no residual value. Our interest expense in this case would be the 4000 About Make sure we're on the right spot. Our lease payable would be the 40 Now remember here we're not doing the 36 payment. We're not doing an actual lease payment here. We're doing the purchase price. So we would actually pay 45 assuming we exercise the option, which all intents purposes we should. Now how does that impact us? Well, pretty much the same way as before just slightly different numbers. You're like, wait, you're getting an asset. You've already had the asset. So this would still be financing because you leased, you borrowed long-term debt. You're financing the operations. Now, what would we do with that asset? Well, at this point, notice our right of use asset still has a balance of, let's see, do 132. That's our right of use. And then we did amortize it. So let's just do that really quick over here just to see what it would be. 
So we started with a right of use asset of 132. Then we amortized three years so far at 22. So we still have the asset at 66,144. That's what it's sitting at on our books, if I got everything in there correctly. We would transfer that over to an asset. So all we would do is take the right of use asset of 66 off and then record it as equipment. So just uh, some type of really quick little entry here. At the end, when we transfer this over, so when we did buy, and let's see, what was it? Was it equipment? Um, double check. It was a machine, so you could call it machinery. So instead of equipment, let's call it machinery. So we would put in our machinery at our 66144. We'd transfer that over, and then we would hit our... Um, right of use asset and that would be 66144 so you basically reclass your right of use over to your machinery um, in most cases from that point forward then at the end of the year you would start to depreciate the asset instead of amortize because it's a physical fixed asset at this point that you actually own you do not have to transition it back to so it's no longer a right of use asset it is an asset you own that asset all right, so that is uh, dealing with a purchase option. It's not that much different from a normal lease. The only difference is you have to treat that as that last payment, so therefore it does go into the, the present value of your minimum lease payments and becomes part of your right of use asset. All right, if you have any questions, let me know. Have a great day.